Hi, I'm Mike Ward, and I want to talk to you about the cost of equity. I want to give you some insights into how we ought to estimate the cost of shareholders' capital. What is it that shareholders want? What should they get? Now, just to kick us off, I want to remind us of the balance sheet. You will know that companies need assets to operate, and so they need machines and vehicles and fixed assets and working capital and so on. And this all has a cost. And these assets are typically funded by, first of all, debt. And debt's got certain characteristics which you are familiar with. First of all, the debt typically is secured by the assets in the company. So if something goes wrong, the bondholders or the debt holders can actually claim the assets uh, and use that to re reclaim their, their capital. Secondly, debt pays interest, or if you're a bondholder, it pays a regular coupon. And so bondholders are pretty safe. Equity capital, on the other hand, which makes up the rest of the capital, is very different. First of all, as you know, shareholders own the company. They have control. And equity gives you a voting right. Secondly, there's typically much more equity than there is debt. The reason for that is that the debt holders want a, a buffer. They want more assets than they're, they're actually putting up uh, debt for. So these things, uh, and, and one more in fact, shareholders do not get guaranteed returns. They don't get interest. If the company makes a profit, they may get a dividend, or the company may choose to retain the dividend uh, and invest it in more assets. So it's much more uncertain, it's more risky. And these things make equity capital more expensive than debt. Surprisingly, many managers don't really understand that. Now, with that background, let me just remind you as well that the reason we're interested in this topic is because assets actually must generate returns which exceed the cost of capital. So if we cannot make a return big enough on our investment in assets over here to cover what it costs to get the capital from the shareholders and bondholders in a weighted sense, we talk about the weighted average cost of capital because these, these things cost different amounts, then we're going to destroy value. And if we want to create positive economic value, EVA, then we're actually going to need to make sure we at least match these two, but preferably exceed the cost of, uh, the cost of capital. So the cost of debt is easy enough. It's basically a case of looking at what interest rates are, what is the bank charging, what do bondholders want, and more of that in another talk. But what we're focusing on today is what is the cost of equity? What do shareholders want and what should they get? So that's our starting point. Now, to begin with, it would be helpful for us to go and look at a bit of history. What have shareholders actually had? And we're going to look across the whole world. So everything's going to be in dollars, and we're going to use the Credit Suisse data, which goes back to 1900. So we've got, in fact, 20, two, well, sorry, 116 years of data here. And you can see uh, what Credit Suisse have done is they've taken the uh, the returns, these are real returns, which means that inflation has been removed from them from 1900 to the end of 2015 here. And a $1 invested into the, into the world, so this is the weighted average of all the economies of the world, if you like, uh, would have tracked this blue line here if you were an equity investor, or if you put your money into government bonds across those countries here, you would have tracked the uh, yellow line here, which is government bonds, and or the greenish line here, which is government bills. These are uh, short-term bonds, if you like, that you lend the government. And you can see there's quite a big difference. Your $1 would, over 116 years, have become $300 had you invested it in equity. And this includes, by the way, the dividends that were reinvested on your behalf. Had you invested in government bonds, not nearly so attractive, your $1 would have become, at best, $8. So that's our starting point. Now, if we were to look at the same data here, not for the world, but just for South Africa, you'll see Credit Suisse produce this graph for us. 
our one dollar in South Africa would have become $3,547. Notice we're still in dollars because they did all of these graphs in dollars. And uh, again, these are real returns. So with inflation, this would have been even higher. If you look at what bonds gave uh, over the same period, long-term bonds about 8%, short-term government bonds about 3%. So this gives us a feel for the kinds of returns that shells have had. And you'll notice that this is much bigger, 10 times as big as the rest of the world, which is interesting. And there are reasons for that. One of which is that we started off a very low base in South Africa. We didn't have much in the way of infrastructure or even an economy back in 1900. We did have a stock exchange because we had mines. But uh, we've had a lot of development to do. We've also got a growing population, growing consumption, and so on. And the stock market in South Africa has done particularly well, even in US dollar terms. In fact, if you were to plot a straight line here to work out the average annual return that shareholders have had, sometimes it's been better, and sometimes, of course, it's been worse, it works out at 7.3% per annum. And remember, that's in US dollars, and that's without inflation. That's a very good average return. Now, if we were to convert this into rands, the graph looks like this. Now, this data goes back, in fact, to January 1960, and the red line here tracks the equity index here for the top biggest 160 companies. This is the total return index. In other words, we are reinvesting dividends. And you will see that it, it uh, streaks upwards over here, uh, and you, this black line here is just a regression line fitted through the data here. And you can see that uh, it looks a little bit uh, flat over the last five years. People always worry. They say, oh, maybe some, you know, the economy is different or it's going to change. It hasn't been doing so well recently. But of course, there have been times in the past where it also hasn't done well, even for quite long periods of time. If you look at the crash of 1968, you might have thought the world had ended. But it recovers. And so I think there's a fair chance that it will recover again. And so we've had, if you annualize this, a 16.9% return. Now, this data is in RANDs, and this is not real data. It includes inflation. So let's call it about a 17% on average over the last 56 years in South Africa. That's not a bad return. Now, if you put your money into government bonds, this stands for the All Bond Index Total Returns, uh, you'd have had this blue line over here. And your return, annualized, would have been about 10%. So you would have had no risk, or much less risk, and we used to say this with more confidence, that government bonds are not risky, but we've seen certain governments failing, and we've seen some interesting economic issues uh, coming along with government bonds more recently. But nevertheless, You'd have had a 10% return, just a bit above inflation, in fact. And uh, you would have had another 7%, almost on that, had you put your money in the market and taken on a bit more risk. We call this the market risk premium, the difference between this 17% here and the 10% over here. It's the extra return, the premium, that you get, you're getting for taking on market risk over and above risk-free assets. So shareholders get something. So that's a starting point. Now, let's go and look at what theory says. And as the famous Yogi Berra once said, well, in theory, theory works. But in practice, theory doesn't work, or often doesn't work. So we wanted to start with a bit of theory. And we're going to use a very famous theory known as the Capital Asset Pricing Model, or often abbreviated as the CAPM. This has got strong roots going back to the 1960s, and uh, a number of economists won Nobel Prizes for this theory, and it's very neat. It basically says that there is a relationship between the return that investors get and the risk that they take. And it says the return can be measured in a linear way, which is always easy, uh, provided you actually measure risk using something called a beta. So we have to understand how to calculate betas and what they mean, and we'll come to that. But if you can measure risk in the form of betas, 
Well, you get this beautiful, nice linear relationship between risk and return. And you will know from your high school maths that we can fit a simple equation to a straight line. You may remember y equals mx plus c or some variation like that. y is, of course, the y-axis. mx is the slope of this line. And to work out the slope, we're going to start off by saying that we have a risk-free rate over here where you can earn a return. We saw that was about 10% just now for uh, South Africa without risk. And, but in addition to that, as you take on more risk, by adding beta, you should get a higher return. And to work out the, the units of, of this or the slope of this line, we, if we take one unit of risk here and we equate this to the market risk, the average risk in the market, just to make it easy for us actually. And then we look to see what is the extra return that shareholders have had over a long period of time. Well, we just saw that was 7%, didn't we? So if you invest in the market, you'd expect to get an additional 7% over and above the 10% that we saw just now. So we put this into an equation, here it is. It says the return that shareholders should get is equal to the risk-free rate, that's the C in the equation, the intercept, plus mx. Here's, here's the m, uh, so the, B, the, the x is actually the beta over here, that's measuring the x-axis over here. We'll have different types of betas. At the moment, we're just looking at one for the market as a whole, times the market risk premium. So you, you can easily work out what return you should get, assuming this relationship works, by knowing these various parameters. Let's take a quick example. Let's say, for example, we want to use the CAPM to estimate the return that shareholders should get if they invest in Standard Bank, if they lend their money to Standard Bank. We need certain parameters to plug into this simple linear equation. We need to know the risk-free rate, that's the intercept. Let's assume it's 10% based on what we saw just now. We need to know the market risk premium. Let's go for 7% based on what we saw just now. And then we need a third parameter, which we need to talk more about, which is the beta. What is Standard Bank? In this, in, in this instance, at any rate, what is their beta? And we can calculate that. And let's say that it comes to 0.5. Once we know those things, we plug in the CAPM. We say, in this instance, the return required by Standard Bank shareholders is equal to the risk-free return that you get for investing in anything, plus beta times the market risk premium. Put in the numbers, risk-free is 10%, plus half of 7% gives us 13.5%. That's the return required by the bank's shareholders. Put differently, that is the cost of equity. That is what equity capital is going to cost Standard Bank, assuming these parameters are correct. Now, does this really work? Well, before we get there, let's first of all just show you briefly how we estimate betas for, for companies. Each company will have a different beta. And we do it like this. We simply say, let's plot the monthly returns on the market, in other words, you'd, you'd invested in something like the Satrix, uh, invested in the All Share Index, actually, what would you have got in a particular month? And we compare that to the return you would have got from Standard Bank. So we would expect to get different data points, and I'm showing a few over here, let's say in this particular month here, the market went up maybe 10%, and Standard Bank only went up, let's say, half of that, 5%, we get this point over here. We plot the, this data for 60 months. There are variations on this model, but we, we simply plot historical data going back the last five years, say, and then we fit a regression line through this. And what the beta is, is really the slope of this line. So if the slope comes out to being 0.5, what does it mean? It means that for every 1% return the market delivers in a particular month, we would expect Standard Bank to give us half of that. Why? Because the slope is 0.5. If the market gives us a 10% return, we would expect to get in Standard Bank about a 5%. But the good news is if the market drops by 10%, we'd expect Standard Bank's return to be only minus 5%. So 
We assume that it's, it's linear and we, we estimate this quite simply using uh, covariances of the market against the, um, the, the companies that we're interested in here. Notice, by the way, it doesn't go through the intercept here. This intercept is not zero here, which we, we call this uh, distance here alpha. We call the slope beta, but the intercept is called alpha. And this is quite nice. It means, for Standard Bank at any rate, that if you're an investor, you get a tiny return here, even if the market does nothing. Better still, the market can even go down a bit and you still get positive returns. So we're always looking for companies which give us alpha. And uh, of course, they're hard to find and it doesn't often last very long. But we're not too interested in alpha now. I'm just showing you some stuff. So once we have estimated the beta, we can plug it into the model like we saw just now. But does this stuff really work? Well, we've done some research, as have many others around the world. And one simple way of looking at this is to go and see what returns did the CAPM estimate for companies and what return did we actually see? So what we did is uh, we took the top 160 shares on the JSC and we looked at this over the period 1985 to 2015. So that's about a 30 year period. We estimated the betas for each share back, going back in time. We looked at the biggest ones each, each quarter, in fact. And we calculated the CAPM. Uh, using the CAPM, we worked out what the expected returns were going to be. And then we plotted them against the actual returns. And we were expecting to get this type of relationship. There should be these things ought to fit on a nice straight line. There should be 45 degrees. What we think we're going to get, we hope we actually get. Did we find that? Well, not quite. And if you're interested, you can go and read the details in uh, this paper, Wharton Miler 2012, published in the Investment Analyst Journal. This is kind of what we got. You'll notice that this doesn't look much like the previous chart. This is showing you the returns of 160 companies. This is over a particular slice of the data. And you'll see it looks nothing like, in fact, what we would hope to find. So subsequently to that, uh, we, we um, also plotted it out in a different way. We calculated, again, using the same 30 years of data, we took the highest beta companies and we, we, uh, we put them into a portfolio. We call these deciles because there were 10 portfolios with um, going down, descending here, if you like, uh, in terms of the median beta, beta of each uh, portfolio. So we would rank the, the companies uh, in terms of their beta, put them into a decile, uh, one tenth of the sample, and then we would look to see what was the actual return in the period that followed. And you'll notice that we have got a linear relationship here. The problem is, and here's the risk-free rate, depending on how you want to measure it over here, you can see this is going the wrong way. This is telling us that the higher the beta, the lower the return you're going to get. This is using empirical data. This is what you actually got. We've cheated a little bit in that the, these dots tend to flatten out over here. You'll notice there is a point of inflection over here. Um, but nevertheless, you can see this just doesn't look like it should. You can go and read the paper if you want to see more about this. Now, what are we going to do? Well, to keep it simple, we're going to say the CAPM doesn't really work. So what we suggest as a rough starting point is that you just use 17%. After all, that has been the average return since 1960 for shares. That includes dividends and capital gains. And since we're not easily able to separate which companies are going to do better than others, and we're going to ignore risk completely because of anything, risk equals risk, which gives you lower returns, we're just going to say, plug in 17%. I hope that helps. Thank you very much.